welcome to this uh, wonderful auditorium and what I hope will be an intellectual face-off of gladiatorial <laughs> lows and highs. The title of the discussion tonight is Democracy, Even the Best Ideas Can Fail, which is not a question but a statement. Now, let me tell you about um, our two speakers. Francis, or Frank Fukuyama, was an unknown State Department official in 1989. Were you unknown then? I guess uh, you were. I knew He's being I very modest. <laughs> he was unknown to the rest of us, but he knew himself very well. When his essay, The End of History, question mark, was published in the National Interest, the Washington-based political journal. At the time, anti-communist protests were sweeping across Europe, and Fukuyama's thesis that the great ideological battles between East and West were over and that Western liberal democracy had triumphed sparked a frenzy of interest. Three years later, he expanded the essay into a book with a fantastic title that everyone is envious of, and it was The End of History and the Last Man, a very bold title for an academic work. But there we go. It became a worldwide bestseller uh, and, of course, provoked plenty of controversy and debate ever since, which is why we're all here. Over the years, Fukuyama has published several more books, all of which have been international bestsellers, translated into numerous languages, um, and so on. His new book is called The Political Order and Political Decay from the French Revolution to the Present, which is part two, and it follows on from another book called The Origins of Political Order. Now, here's the title of, of your fellowship. It is, um, it's a complicated one. He's the Olivier Nomellini Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spolli Institute for International Studies in Stanford, California, which is a glorious place. We're going to hear from Frank in a minute. Um, as I think Hannah said, everyone has 10 minutes, of each of you, and then we're going to mix it up a little bit with a discussion. Now, let me move over to you, David. David Ronsiman. David Ronsiman is the professor of politics at Cambridge University. He writes regularly about politics for the London Review of Books and for The Guardian. He is perhaps best known for his book, The Confidence Trap, a History of Democracy in Crisis from World War I to the Present, which is described by Jonathan Friedland in The Guardian as a coincidence. Quote, Total coincidence. <laughs> no money or favors changed hands. He said about your book, a lucid, wholly original book. That's not the most stunning quote I think we can come up with. <laughs> I didn't write my own book. <laughs> I know, you should have, I mean, a lucid and wholly original. I read your book. I really liked your book. I could have come up with something better. <laughs> but hang on a minute. There's another chap, John Gray, in the New York Review of Books. And he called it an antidote to the moods of alarm and triumph by which writers on democracy are regularly seized. So you're like a sort of anti-Viagra for the excitement <laughs> that we're all gripped by. It's a good book. His, recent, his most recent book is simply called politics. Um, and I should say that both the books, but both your latest book and your The Confidence Trap and Politics are on a very large table outside. And I urge you to buy a copy and you will have it signed by the authors themselves. And that'll happen after all this. I haven't finished yet, though. You also enjoy writing about sport. Which sport? Any sport. Any sport. Any sport. And he says, I find it hard to resist comparisons between politics and sport. Sport is good for showing up the absurdity of politics, and politics is good for showing up the seriousness of sport. <laughs> I must have what said that somewhere. What the hell does somewhere. that mean? <laughs> okay, we'll get on yeah, to that not, later. We won't do that Okay, tonight. we won't do that tonight. No, it's too serious. It's a good, it's a good quote. Um, anyway, tonight, uh, 25 years, more or less, after... Two extraordinary events, which I remember covering as a journalist, the massacre in Tiananmen Square and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Intelligence Squared have brought together these two brilliant thinkers to debate and discuss how far the end of history hypothesis, that's your fault, Frank, has been shown to be right, and to examine how liberal democracy is faring today. Liberal democracy is on the couch, and we shall take its temperature. Okay, Frank, you first. And then it's David's turn. All right. Please. Thank you. Uh, well, I've been sitting all day, and I'm told that I could walk around, so I'm going to take advantage. I was also told there's a clock somewhere, but I don't see it, so... It's up there, and it's 10 minutes slow. Uh, yes, so I okay. will... I tell you what, if you, well, you have your watch. I have my watch. If I you can, go I can, massively over, okay. I will tap the glass. Yes, okay. I'm so, sure you won't. Uh, so I guess to begin, 
my feeling was that uh, I was really uncomfortable by the title of this session, that even uh, the best ideas can fail, which I take it was David Runciman's uh, inspiration. And it really rubs, game has started. Yeah. It, it rubs me the wrong way because uh, it assumes that democracy has failed. And uh, I think that it's probably a good idea to start with a little bit of an overview of the past uh, 40, 50 years. So if you wind the clock back to the year 19... 70. Uh, there were about 35 democracies in the world, uh, electoral democracies of any sort. Most of them were concentrated in Europe and North America. Uh, if you go to the year 2014, uh, by Freedom House's count, there's approximately 110 or even 120. Uh, now, it's true that Freedom House says that the number of democracies has declined uh, continuously over the last eight years. And obviously, this has not been a great year for democracy, with the rise of, of ISIS and Russia and China uh, making very aggressive moves at both ends of Eurasia. But despite that reversion, uh, democracy still is the default uh, form of government in the world. Uh, and I think that it's important to keep in mind what Churchill said, that this is the worst system of government but for all the alternatives. And if you think about that, uh, it's still true. Like, how many of you actually would like to move to Syria or Iraq right now? I doubt, uh, and, and, and um, as a model, you know, it's, it's really amazing. This group uh, of terrorists has succeeded in uniting Saudi Arabia and Iran in opposition uh, to them. And that's quite an achievement if you think about it. Uh, and so uh, if you take the more serious models, uh, even a country like China, uh, I think many people uh, envy China because they're very rich, but they project virtually no soft power at all. I mean, very, very few people think, ah, oh, it would be great to move to Beijing with all that wonderful air and the nice food uh, and, 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 and the like. Russia is, is absurd. Uh, everything I, everyone, I think, realizes that Russia is a petrostate. It doesn't have a sustainable model. And so I think realistically, you know, where, where else do we want to go to Argentina or to, you know, Nicaragua? Uh, the list uh, gets uh, uh, progressively worse. So that's my opening, <laughs> my opening shot. But now I'm going to uh, spend the rest of the time saying that I actually agree uh, with a bit of the premise because I do think that democracy is in trouble. Uh, and I think the single cause of the trouble that democracy is in right now is basically its failure to deliver on the things that people want out of government, which is basic issues like security, services, education, uh, health care, and the like, and, uh, and particularly in the area of political corruption, because I actually think that one of the biggest divides in the world right now is not democracy versus authoritarian government. It's the division between governments that are corrupt and those that actually deliver uh, the services, the basic services, in a relatively impersonal way. Let me give you just three quick examples. Ukraine. What happened to Ukraine? Uh, you had a rose revolution, uh, I'm sorry, uh, an orange revolution uh, in 2004 that failed very quickly because the orange coalition themselves were corrupt, they fought among one another, uh, and they could not govern Ukraine. And this is why Mr. Yanukovych uh, made a big comeback in uh, 2010. If you think about the fight that's going on now between Putin on the one hand and people like Yanukovych and the people in Kiev, it's really that the people in Kiev, I mean, you know, Putin was democratically elected, as was Yanukovych. The problem is that this is a corrupt, rent-seeking, you know, bunch of people that they're more like a mafia organization uh, than like an impersonal government. Uh, second example, the world's largest democracy is, um, uh, is India. There was a study done in the late 1990s that in northern India, in the poor states in northern India, 50% of school teachers did not show up for work even though they were being paid. And after 10 years of struggling with this issue, trying to reform the system, the number stayed at 50%. So this is, I think, why Mr. Modi was elected uh, last year, because there's a hope that somehow they can cut through all the blather and actually get to uh, effective government. And then finally, you know, Greece uh, in the European Union, the reason that uh, I think they uh, got uh, into the trouble they got into was when democracy came back to Greece in, uh, in 1974, the two 
big Greek parties spent all of their time trying to figure out how to divide up the spoils of government uh, between themselves rather than actually uh, doing things like collecting taxes and uh, you know, delivering effective education and the like. And I guess the thing that makes me a little bit upset is the fact that I think my country, the United States, that uh, for you know, most of my um, uh, lifetime has been the model of democracy in, in many respects for many people around the world, is decaying. The political system is decaying. Uh, and I define decay in a very specific way. Any political system uh, is subject to being captured by its own elites. Anybody with wealth and power in any pol political system, democratic or authoritarian, uh, the, the elites try to use the system to pad their own nests. And unless there's a continual struggle against that, uh, that's what's going to happen. And the theory is, in a democracy, we don't want corruption or we don't want uh, bad government because the people will rise up and throw, uh, throw the bums out. And I'm afraid this hasn't been happening. If you think about the financial crisis that we just went through, it was caused by uh, a lot of these too-big-to-fail banks. Uh, and essentially, they have succeeded uh, in using this kind of inside power to block, uh, I think, any real form of uh, financial regulation. Uh, they are more concentrated than they were in 2007 before the onset of the crisis. But if you follow American politics in any detail, you know, the power of interest groups and the power of entrenched interests to use our check and balance political system has produced what I call a vitocracy. A vitocracy meaning that it is too easy for concentrated, small, well-organized groups to stop things that hurt their interest. And I think this is a more generic problem in many places like Japan, like Italy, uh, like India, uh, democracies where power is insufficiently exercised so that there isn't uh, a good exercise uh, of authority. And this is a question, I think, for the future of all of us because if the United States or other democratic countries <laughs> or the EU as a whole is going to project an image of a successful political system that can produce uh, prosperity and, and basically honest government, uh, we've got to fix these problems. But at the moment, uh, I'm actually pessimistic in the case of my own country, the United States, about whether the political will uh, to do this really uh, exists. And so uh, I don't think this is a failure because we've been through crises before. You know, in the 1930s, you had a similar financial sector failure, and then the country picked itself up and, and reformed the system. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but I do think that the future of the democratic idea, it's, it's not something that we can take for granted. You just can't take it for granted. Democracy is the result of people that want democracy. If they're not willing to fight for it, and if they're not willing to organize and mobilize, it's not going to happen. So thank you very much. Thank you. OK. David. OK, thanks. Um, so the title was my idea, or at least it, it came from a discussion with the organizers. But I never thought it meant that democracy has failed. It means that it could. And it depends, and we'll have a discussion about this, it depends whether we think being in trouble and systemic failure come close to each other or not. I suspect we may, we may differ about that. I have no problem with the thought that liberal democracy is a very good idea. It is a very good idea. And I think it's pretty hard for us at this point in history, in this kind of society, stable, secure, by any historical standards, incredibly prosperous, to think outside the box of liberal democracy to think of a better idea. It's, it's really difficult for us. But even the best ideas can fail. And that's what I think we're here to talk about. How can good ideas go wrong? And good ideas go wrong when they collide with what's practically possible. And when they collide with practical feasibility and they don't adapt and they don't adjust, when they hit reality and they lose, and I think the last 25 years since 1989, we have seen a lot of liberal democracy colliding with what's practically possible and coming out worse. And I think that's particularly true, and I don't imagine we would disagree about this, in the places 
where we have thought it such a good idea that we should try and spread liberal democracy as quickly as we can. And I think the mistake, the trap that it's easy to fall into, and I think this trap has been fallen into a lot in the past 25 years, is to think that because democracy is such an attractive idea, and it is unquestionably, and it has an appeal that does transcend all sorts of cultural and other barriers, it has got a global appeal. There's a demand for it, there's an appetite for it. We saw it in the Arab Spring. That was a genuine drive for democracy. Because it looks so appealing to so many people, we assume that ought to make it easier for those societies to overcome the practical problems in the way of democracy. And actually, I think it makes it harder. I think in lots of places, the appeal of democracy is a very bad indicator of its chances of success because democracy is appealing in places where politics doesn't work. If I, if you, if any of us lived under Mubarak's Egypt or Saddam Hussein's Iraq, democracy would be a hugely appealing idea. But those are the places where a good idea is not enough. You need all sorts of other practical reforms where politics is corrupt and brutal and inefficient, cruelly inefficient and tyrannical and divisive and sectarian. Democracy is a hugely appealing idea, and it is not a practical solution often. And I think we've learned that in the last 25 years. So in the places where it has the strongest appeal, it often has the least chance of success. And in the places where it has got a real chance of success, there are lots of parts of the world which are reasonably well governed at the moment and aren't democracies. And that might even include China. It would certainly include places like Singapore. It's currently not very appealing. And the reason it's not very appealing is, I think, primarily because every good idea needs a kind of showroom example of what really is possible. And for 200 years, the showroom example of democracy has been the United States. And in the last 10 to 15 years, it's a bad advert. And again, I think we may agree about this. It's a really bad advert for democracy. Not because it's fundamentally corrupt, not because it's cruel and oppressive and tyrannical in the ways I talked about in other parts of the world, but because it is really shop-soiled and tawdry and messy and it's ugly. So in the places where democracy has appeal, it has, I think, the least chance of success. In the places where it might work, it's not very appealing. The reasons why American democracy at present is stuck Frank's talked about some of them, but I just want to offer in my five minutes I've got left a different perspective on this, a slightly broader perspective. I don't think it's just about capture by elites, and I don't think it's enough, and I think we will disagree on this. I don't think it's enough to say democracy survived crises in the past, and though it's in trouble and though it looks stuck, it has the adaptability to come out of this. It might, but it might not, and that might be the way in which it can fail. So to put this very broadly, Democracy is an appealing idea for two kinds of reasons, a positive reason and a negative reason. The positive appeal of democracy, and Frank talked about this in his End of History essay, it's an idea of empowerment, of dignity, of self-worth, the idea that ordinary people can take control of their politics. That's at the heart of the appeal of democracy on one side. And on the other side, the negative appeal of democracy is the kick the bums out side of democracy. Democracy is the best system yet devised in the Churchill sense for avoiding the worst. Democracy is a way of hearing the bad news in time to do something about it. Making mistakes, democracies are always making mistakes, but correcting them before they become fatal or disastrous. Democracies are very good at creeping to the edge of the cliff, peering over, and then creeping back. Other systems of government, the risk is you get to the edge of the cliff and our leader will take you over the edge. That's why democracy has the advantage that we can kick the bastards out. And I think we tend to assume that the positive story is the reason why democracy has been a success over the last 100 years, and I really doubt that. I don't see much evidence over the last 100 years of genuine democratic empowerment in that positive sense. I think the negative story is the reason for the success. Democracies have made fewer or at least least bad mistakes than rival systems, less bad mistakes than rival systems. The mistakes they've made, they've tended to correct. They've woken up in time. They've faced repeated crises, they've stumbled to the edge of the cliff, and they've stumbled back. And I think it would be crazy to think that that pattern is sure to repeat itself for the next 100 years. And I think there are reasons to think that that model, that reactive model, that democracy is the best system because it's the one that can react in time to stop the disaster, that that model is likely to persist. And I'll just give you three very quick reasons why. First, 
That model depends on the bad news reaching us in time to do something about it. And it may be that one challenge that we face, the environmental challenge, the news won't reach us in time. I mean, the bad news reaching us, I mean, we come face to face with the threat. If there is a time lag here, if preemptive action is what's needed, the last hundred years are no guide to the next hundred years, because there's nothing, I think, in the historical record that shows that democracies are good at far-sighted preemptive action. They are responsive and reactive. It may be that when we hear the bad news, it'll be too late. The second reason is the pace of technological change. Democracy works to a kind of time scale. We kick the bastards out after a few years when we've had enough of them. The pace of technological change in the last 25 years is unprecedented. And democracies feel increasingly like they're playing catch up. They're not molding this technology. They're following in its wake. And the risk there, I think, and this is where there isn't an, a rival idea to democracy in the world of politics, but there is a rival, which is a kind of anti-politics, a technocratic anti-politics. There is a growing, I think, sense that given democracy seems ugly and clumsy and messy, that technology should find us a way around it, that we can use technology to bypass politics, and that could be fatal, because using technology to bypass politics corrodes politics, and there will come a point when we need politics to rescue us, and if technology has corroded it, it won't be there when we need it. And the last point, which relates to the question of crises, I think the strength of democracy in the past 100 years has been its ability, when faced with a crisis, to muddle its way through. And the crises have operated on the kind of scale in the 30s and the 70s. They take a long time. It's horrible to live through it. There are many, many losers as well as winners. But over a 10, 15 year period, we come out the other side. Thinking forward the next 100 years, I think it's increasingly hard to imagine the kinds of crises that can wake up old, secure, prosperous democracies to the kinds of threats they face, but aren't so serious that they threaten democracy itself. I mean, war was the traditional way this happened, and Frank writes about it in his new book. It's, it's one of the cliches of political science. War makes states, states makes war, make war. War is the engine of political development, but the kinds of wars we fight now, the war we're about to embark on against ISIS, proxy wars, drone wars, technological wars, are they going to galvanize Western democracies, or are they going to continue this process of corrosion? The environmental crisis may not reach us in time. There's one final possibility, and this is the thing I'll conclude with. One thing that hasn't happened in the last 25 years, I think the most striking feature of the last 25 years, since the triumph of democracy, since the end of history, is that we've lived through a technological revolution. And over that time, our politics hasn't changed much, and our technology has transformed all of our lives. But we haven't had a crisis of the new technology yet. There has been no technological crisis, no systemic failure. The economic crisis was close. I mean, people talked about the moment when the banks would be shut, the cash points would be shut, what would happen then, but we didn't get there. But there will be a crisis of the technology. We've had scandals, we've had revelations, the Snowden affair. We haven't had the crisis of the new technology. Systemic failure, some kind of interconnected collapse in the way this technology works. I think it would be crazy to think that's never coming. But I don't think there's any reason to suppose that the previous crises we lived through are necessarily a good guide to what happens when we get a crisis of the new technology. We are all of us, political scientists, we're over-reliant on history. And maybe that this time is different. I don't think we know what failure looks like for our societies. I don't think it looks like the 1930s. I don't think it looks like the 1970s. And if we don't know what failure looks like, there's a chance that we'll miss it or we won't be able to adapt. So I, I genuinely do think even the best ideas can fail. I don't think that they will, but they can. David, thank you very much. Thank you as well. Very good. <laughs> OK. Well, let's, um, let's start off with a, with, a, with a kind of positive and relatively simple question. We know that you don't want to live in Syria, and you seem to have delayed your green card application indefinitely by, by slagging off uh, the United States, but that's OK. Um, we can get you a good lawyer to sort that problem out. Is there a least worst democracy that you would choose to live in? It's obviously not the United States. Which country would you choose where the application of democracy has worked better than anywhere else? <laughs> Well, you know, so it's a complicated question to uh, answer. You know, I, I wrote a book called Trust where I said, you know, there's certain high trust societies and then there's Italy. And, uh, 
and I went through the whole reasons why, you know, like Scandinavia, you know, was more efficient and so forth. And then finally, the interviewer got a little impatient with me and said, now, come on, <laughs> which of these countries would you really rather, you, you know, you want to live in, 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 in uh, you know, in, in uh, Sweden or in Italy? And I said, yeah, I want to live in Italy, you know, because <laughs> life, is, life is better there. So there's a difference between what's the most effective democratic political system and which is the most appealing society. Uh, but I would have to say that, you know, there's a lot of successful, very successful democracies right now. Germany has been going great guns for the last uh, 15 years at least. They reformed their labor market. Uh, they're very, very competitive, a little bit too competitive as we now know. Uh, but the countries of Scandinavia, Holland, I mean, all of these countries have managed to adapt to changing technologies. The one thing that I like about the Germans uh, makes them very different from my country, the United States. So in the United States, we tell all of our children, you have to go to Stanford and MIT. You know, you have to start that startup and make a gazillion dollars, mm -hmm. otherwise you're a total failure. Germans say something different. You know, the Germans, first of all, don't really care about, you know, they don't have any universities in the top, you know, couple dozen uh, ranked uh, uh, internationally. But they take their working class and they say, we're going to give you training to be a machinist or a welder or whatnot, and we're going to give you dignity because we believe that this is actually an important uh, thing to do. And I think the social impact of that is to really cushion people against this kind of technological change that is, and, and I actually agree, I didn't talk about technology, but I agree very much with David. Uh, and, and actually, I'm not worried about this sudden technological collapse. I'm worried about the Google self-driving car. I mean, I run into these things on the freeway, you know, where I live in Palo Alto. It's, one of, it's one of the uh, downsides of living in Silicon Valley. Yeah, well, but, but seriously, if you think about a world in which this car becomes ubiquitous, what about all of these first-generation immigrants whose job is to drive a car right now? And that, that's the kind of main route to upward social mobility for people that don't speak the language necessarily or don't have the right skills. Uh, and it seems to me that this is the problem that, that my country has really not done a very good mm. job wrestling with, but the Germans have. Right? Okay, so Germany has the beacon of democracy, 75 years after... Yeah, it's a German, <laughs> Germany is a young democracy. Mm. I mean, that's the other thing. We're, we're talking about political decay in the United States. The United States is a self-described young country. It's a very, very old democracy. And German democracy, its success, we can't get away from the fact its success is built on the kind of crisis and the kind of collapse that no society would ever wish on itself. And these things are very, very hard to recreate. Um, I think there you are lots... You wouldn't want to. You, you wouldn't want to, and you wouldn't want to even artificially try and recreate some of the clean slate conditions that would allow for that. I mean, it's also true, and Frank's written about this, that Germany had a strong straight state tradition before yeah. that, before the, the collapse. But to take these countries as models that other countries can copy or adapt, it's a very, very unhelpful. The question of where would you like to live is one question. Yeah. Another question, which is a question that people in this audience might ask, is not so much would you like to move or X or Y, but do you think we should adopt, if we really don't like our democracy, if we don't like our politics, should we adopt somewhere else's practice? And I do agree with Frank that we're still very much in that liberal democratic bubble. Does anyone in this room think that British democracy would go better if we adopted more Chinese political practices. But I guess the question I mean, is also, to what extent can we talk about it as a system of government, and to what extent should one have to look at individual cases, individual countries? And are the differences between these countries so great that in some cases they you know, rendered the question whether even the best ideas can fail irrelevant? Well, they're all examples of the idea. I think we can all recognize that the really successful democracies, liberal democracies around the world <coughs> are part of an ideal type, and, and we can recognize what that type is. We don't really doubt what we should call them, whether it's Denmark or Germany. Mm. So they tend to be quite close together, Denmark, Germany, <laughs> Scandinavia, um, but even Britain, the United States, and so on. So it, it's not that every country is unique, and it would be crazy to say that one country has lessons for another country, but the transferring of the lessons from one country to another country under the umbrella of this very attractive idea is mind-bogglingly difficult. 
and the attraction of the idea makes it harder, not easier, because the attraction of the idea can drag you away from the details. But what you seem to be saying in your book, the confidence trap, is that you know it's kind of inherently systemic in the DNA of democracy that having muddled through for so many years, you know, it could, there could just be that one mistake that's that, that's gone too far, and that therefore brings the system crashing down. That there's something about democracy, the success of democracy also might set it up to be its failure. Do you agree with that, Frank? Uh, I think that uh, if you think about old democracies like the United States, that's absolutely the case. Uh, Americans <laughs> really don't think their institutions are anything other than perfect. I mean, we worship our own constitution. And I think actually, I mean, this is what I argue in, in, in the new book, that many of our governance failures actually stem from the very nature of the constitution that James Madison created. We created so many checks and balances that we're now completely checked in our ability to do things like pass a budget or pass just ordinary uh, legislation. But to suggest to an American that the problem may be a really fundamental one in the whole design of our presidential system and, and, and you know the ideas of the founding fathers <laughs> that don't really correspond to the needs of a modern, uh, uh, a modern governance system uh, is to commit a certain kind of heresy. So I absolutely think that this is, you know, this is the other big, in, in my view, source of political decay, that you, you develop institutions to meet the conditions of one historical period of time, then the conditions change, but you've worshipped your own institutions in a way that make, you know, makes it impossible to, uh, to modify them then. I mean, the, you know, the, the checks and balances of the American system were essentially set up to prevent George Washington from becoming another, an elected monarch. Yeah. And we've moved on a little bit uh, since then. Yeah. But how do you explain the unbelievably bitter partisan fighting, trench warfare in Washington, in American politics at the moment, um, when in fact bipartisanship is one of those cliches that is trotted out over and over again? After all, this country fought a, the most bruising war that America has ever fought was its own civil war. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to understand that phenomenon, and, but it's absolutely the case that the degree of hostility between the two parties is something I've never seen in my lifetime. There are a lot of theories about this, so one has to do with the media, that we've now got this completely segmented media, everybody is in their own echo chamber, they only hear ideas that, that they like to hear. Uh, Americans are sorting themselves out by neighborhood, so they only want to live with people that either own guns or don't own guns, uh, this sort of thing. Uh, and then I think there's just a d dynamic in the political class itself where money and competition has driven them uh, into this, you know, uh, into this fit of um, uh, partisanship, uh, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So Americans, and by the way, it didn't start with George Washington. It started with your king, George the Third. We didn't like it's George another III. George. Yeah, another George. So. The whole constitution is based, you know, and, and the whole American political culture is based on distrust of government. And so Americans, therefore, do not want to pay taxes because they don't want to support this monster. Uh, and they don't want to grant it any real authority because they don't trust it to do the right thing. And sure enough, it doesn't have the resources and it doesn't function very well. And then Americans turn around and say, yeah, see, government doesn't work. Um, I, think, I, I think there are two sides to this. There's the reverence for the system, and then there's the Which historical... Which is a bad idea, you think? Well, it, when it combines with the historic knowledge of an old democracy that it survived so long because it's also been adaptable. We revered this system, it's set in stone, this holy text, but actually it's also been super adaptable as well, that we've found a way around this. And so if you have a situation like you have now, or you had last year, where politicians are so angry about the way politics is going, and they are so divided, and they're so incapable of finding a common ground that they shut down the government. That's both a symptom, I think, of a real rage and distrust of these institutions and a kind of complacency that these institutions can survive anything. And I think that kind of schizophrenic mindset can coexist in a political culture, that we both think this doesn't work anymore, and it works so well that our thinking it doesn't work anymore isn't going to destroy it. And at a certain point, you need that wake-up call, something mm. to cut through that noise. And I still find it hard to know that the crisis of 2008 was not that wake-up call. It, as you say, it entrenched some of these faults rather than correcting for them. We need something bigger than that, and then you start to think something bigger than the crisis of 2008 is not something that anyone would who want. values democracy in their right mind mm. should wish for. Yeah. So we may be trapped. 
So, I mean, the, I mean the, the issue of inequality, which is one of those things that really came out of the 2008 financial crisis, which has not been solved. I mean, we are now less equal than we were um, five years ago, yeah. 10 years ago. There's this amazing statistic, which I keep trotting out, that the difference between a CEO of a company on Wall Street and the secretary in terms of earnings in 1978 was 22 to 1, and now it's 445 to 1. That's not good. That is not good. But to what extent is our distrust of democracy as a functioning system to do with the fact that democracy simply doesn't deliver the stuff that we have all come to expect in the post-Second World War period? Well, it's, it's drifted towards not delivering it. And one of the striking features is the discovery that is now almost a conventional wisdom that this has been going on for 40 years. But the noise and the anger around it, it took the crisis to kind of bring it to the surface, that a lot of this was happening under the radar. But even the appetite for Thomas Piketty's book is evidence mm. that there is a real desire for ideas for thinking about it differently, but they are within the democratic framework. That's not a revolutionary call to turn mm. over the system. That's a technocratic fix for the way it's currently misfunctioning. We haven't got a match as yet, I think, between the anger, which is real in the last five years, mm and the range of viable political solutions and outlets because it's still being channel channeled by the system that caused the problem. So something's got to So give. the anger is there. It's sweating out of the, you know, the body politic, but it's not actually changed. It's not found a, a credible expression. Is that what you're saying? Or? It's, n it's, not, it's not found a galvanizing expression right. yet. The kind of galvanizing expression, what I think the history of democracy does show, is that when the big changes happen, they do happen in a kind of rush at that point where the bad news arrives in a way that it produces a kind of collective response. At the moment, it's producing still a divisive response. So we had plenty of bad news after the financial crisis, but it didn't produce that kind of you know, catalyst of, of no, but, real change. But also, Why part, is that? Well, part of the reason I think these historical analogies we have to be careful about, the 1930s and 1970s, these are just such different societies. We are so much relatively richer, more prosperous, more secure, mm. more peaceful. You know, war, genuine war, war that galvanizes the whole democracy is not on the radar anymore. The kind of threat of poverty and decay that was existed in the 1930s is not on the radar anymore. And you can't recreate that kind of fear, but in the absence of that fear, you need a different way of telling the positive story. But that's the thing I find hard to imagine, because I think the negative story is what's been driving this. I'm sorry to be but, so gloomy, but it's... <laughs> it's, diff it's difficult. No. Frank is here to it is give different. us the no, positive story. No, I think that one of the strangest things to my mind is how, despite the fact that this is a crisis that started on Wall Street and in some sense can be blamed on the excesses of market competition, that there hasn't been a left-wing populist movement that's uh, arisen in response to it. Well, it's, Occupy Wall Street tried. Uh, yeah, but these are they just tried. a bunch of kids. I yeah. mean, they're not... They didn't have some a serious... Some of them are probably... <laughs> Some of them are here in the audience. Some no, of them are now running companies in Silicon Valley. Yeah. You know. No, but but Occupy, you know, was was not a mass movement. No. Uh, on, but in, why in didn't? Why well, wasn't there a mass? Well, movement? Well, so I I don't know, but I have some theories, and one is that, at least in the United States, uh, the left abandoned the basic economic agenda that it used to have uh, in favor of identity politics, and so right now, you know. Uh, gay marriage, uh, feminism, you know, whether we elect a woman uh, to the White House, ethnic politics, multiculturalism, all of these things are actually much more preoccupying, but they're also div divisive because the left doesn't really agree on a common agenda, and economic inequality is just one, one cause in addition to all of these other identity politics issues, and I think that's been a distraction. Now, it may be that over time, Inequality will get so bad that people will refocus on this, but I think for the time being, the energies of the left have been kind of dissipated in a lot of other kinds of issues. And in many ways, the election of Obama is the symbol of that. It, it, it was heralded rightly as a moment of absolutely fundamental change, and in structural terms, nothing changed. Did nothing, mm. right. Um, and these are the ways in which mature democracies distract themselves. I want to open up to the audience in a minute, but just one more question for both of you. I mean, you mentioned in your um, opening speech that democracy is playing catch up with technology. Mm. To what extent has technology, the, the internet, I mean, the, the, our ability to have information at our fingertips, um, round the clock on our mobile phones, whatever, to what extent is that a real problem for democracy or an opportunity? Well, it's, I think it is an opportunity, and there, the, 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 it comes and goes in waves over the last 25 years during this end of history period, that kind of 
technological utopianism about the possibility of a new way of doing democracy that really galvanizes it. And actually what we've had so far isn't really democracy, liberal democracy, party democracy. There's the possibility for the real thing. But I think almost all the experiments and imagination around this is about local politics. Yeah. And it's only it's possible that we could scale down, but unless we can scale up as well, but the scaling down. No one's going to come up with any work. ideas about how to marry democracy with you know with your mobile phone. You know the democracy yeah. app is missing so far from my phone anyway. Yeah, I mean there are lots of ways we could do this. We could everyone in this room could vote on issues every day. But I think that period of fantasy about politics has gone. I think it's been replaced by much more of a kind of localist fantasy that this technology, I mean, things like 3D printing, you hear versions of a new kind of politics, that could open up the opportunity for local production, local cooperation, but it's all local. Mm. And a world in which democracy goes local is a world where bigger politics leaves that behind. It's got to go international as well. I actually have a much more negative view about the impact of technology on democracy because, you know, there's been a view that, technology will permit greater transparency and much greater participation. And I think the sad fact is that people, uh, most people in, in modern democratic societies do not have the time, uh, attention span, or knowledge to actually govern themselves in the way that a modern society uh, requires. So for example, in my state of California, uh, we have this initiative system because people thought the legislature was too corrupt and captured by special interests. Uh, and so what happens, we vote on these ridiculous, you know, 50-page uh, ballot measures. Nobody reads them, and it's the same powerful, well-funded interest groups that dominate uh, that process. Television and transparency for the U.S. Congress has been a disaster. Congressmen do not talk to each other now that they're on TV 24-7, because instead of actually deliberating about an issue in common, uh, they only speak to activist audiences somewhere mm. out in TV land. And as a result, they don't say anything serious yeah. any longer. And I think we got to rethink whether more participation and more transparency mm. are always the best routes to getting to, to really good governance. It's very interesting, Frank, actually, because if you, I don't know if any of you have ever watched a Senate here, I mean, you know, the Senate in session in uh, Washington, it is like watching paint dry. And the reason is that it's not actually a debate. And you notice that the senator is always looking like that. He doesn't look at the audience, because there is no audience. So they address the one camera that's sort of in the ceiling, because they're talking to the voters, that's if right. anyone is watching. But they don't debate with each other. Um, OK, uh, on that, after that little aside, let's go to some questions in the audience. Who has a question? Gentleman in the front here. Dr. Kendrick, can I suggest that um, democracy has got into a sort of regressive spiral. And in order to get elected, governments promise more and more. And they actually can't deliver it. There, there isn't the resource to deliver it. And so people get dissatisfied. And you then get a further round of elections and, and more things are promised and the problems are promised to be solved and it doesn't happen. And actually, what's happened is that government's got too big. It's trying to do too much. And actually, we need to go back to individual responsibility in smaller government. OK. And, all right, so that's a statement, which could also be construed as a question. All right. Do you agree with that statement? David, you first. Um, I, I, so I, this is where I think you should read Frank's new book, because one of the... <laughs> Can we just savor this moment for a minute? Yeah. <laughs> no, this, it's is a, really, this is no, an incredible I, moment. No, it's a really, really... I want you as my friend. David. Really interesting yeah. book. But one of the... And Frank can say more about this, but one of the really striking it, arguments in Frank's book, and he'll have to correct me if I've got this wrong, is if you want to shrink government, you need a strong, powerful state to do it. The only thing that can shrink the state is the state. The danger is that we get into a spiral where our distrust and discredit of government means that the people that we need to actually take these kinds of decisions are powerless to do it. And what you end up with in the desire to shrink the state is you erode state capacity and so you bloat it. And I believe that's your argument about what's happened in America. No, that's, yeah, you put it better I than I did. I, yeah. So, so. <laughs> we... <laughs> Just we leave us alone, guys. It's getting a little bit intimate here. We yeah. need to be careful. I mean, it's a really important argument. We need to be careful that, that the current politics, which is the government's too big, the state's too big, small government works best. If it takes the wrong bits of government away, it actually makes the problem worse. And I think that's the situation that we're in danger of getting ourselves in. And okay. the one thing I'd add to that is I, I just think the quality of government 
is much more important than its size. Okay. Um, now we've got a whole bit, we're going to bunch some questions together because they're all in the general geographical area. Um, that gentleman there with the glasses first, please. If you ask your question, and then we're going to go to the two ladies up in the, the second last row. So if you ask it first, we'll stall them up. Thank you. My question is for David, actually. I'd like to pick up on his point uh, that uh, democracy is especially appealing where gut politics is dysfunctional. I, I think that's a half-truth. Uh, you gave the example of China, where uh, you said people are not terribly in favor of democracy, government's reasonably efficient, but the last time I think the people of China asked for democracy, the government sent in the tanks 25 years ago. How do we know whether they want democracy now? Look at the one territory in, in China where there is actually, people actually can have a say, and that's Hong Kong. And there is a big dispute going on now over whether the, the people can have the democracy that they want or whether Beijing will allow it. I think this is a, there's a mis, there is a misconception here where we are conflating democracy and effective administration. The two are quite separate. Okay, actually, let's just, sorry, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. Um, let's just answer this question first briefly, David. Yeah, I, don't, I, I wasn't trying to say that, I think it is true, and it's the point I began with, that liberal democracy is a very appealing idea almost everywhere under a wide variety of circumstances. And of course, I can imagine in lots of scenarios in China and in other parts of the world, even if you're living under an efficient administration, the appeal of being able to run your own affairs and being able to kick the bastards out is very, very strong. But I think traditionally that appeal has also had to go with a sense that democracy is working well in the places where it's established. And if you take that part out of it, I think some of the drive behind that is liable to be dissipated. So if, if you think I only gave half the picture, I think it is half the story that democracy is probably appealing everywhere. I think it is a universal idea. But lots of places where it might work, I think its appeal is currently quite seriously diluted by the failure of the established democracies. And that failure has been in the last 10 years. Is the, the, the universal appeal of democracy, does that diminish uh, when societies are well run and people don't feel the need to kick out the bastards every four years? Right. It, it varies. I think that uh, democracy's appeal, you know, is weakened by bad governance and, and the inability to supply basic services. But there is also this funny characteristic of democracies that they promote competition almost for its own sake. And so, you know, you get countries that are actually working very well where people absolutely hate each other in the political class. And it's not an appealing thing. And I think this is part of the reason that people don't like politicians in very, very many countries. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, it's something to worry about because it gets to the legitimacy of the system. Okay, two questions up there. Second last row, please. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, so you seem to have quite a negative view of technology, but what about um, civil society organizations using technology? So organizations like Avaz or Witness or Human Rights Watch, which are actually using technology to highlight abuses by governments and actually encouraging political participation and making it easy by just signing a petition with one click to actually engage uh, voters. Okay, we'll take the next question as well, please. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, so you've talked about different types of democracies and democracies that have been success successful, especially in Europe. And I was just wondering what was your opinion about the Swiss democracy, which kind of tries to combine the uh, popular vote with a kind of a typical, kind of more typical democratic system. And also the fact that I think it's one of the rare countries when the concept of opposition party does not really exist in a sense. So just wondering what your thoughts on that were. Okay, who, Frank, do you want to start off? Well, okay, so I was not making any kind of blanket condemnation of technology. And you're absolutely right that technology has enabled uh, transnational organization and civil society has taken off as a result. And I think that's one of the big forces out there that you know, counterbalances corporate power and the power of other large you know, of governments. It, it keeps them honest uh, and the like. Um, so I think that that is actually now a new element that is uh, out there that's led to the mobilization and the participation of a lot of people. Now, I'm not sure I worry about the one-click business because it seems to me that genuine political participation ought to be something more than just a like, you know, like, you know, <laughs> this human rights violation is, is you know, happening, you know, so I, I don't like that. And, you know, people <laughs> don't realize that that's not enough to stop the human rights violation, you know, it takes something more. But 
at least they know about it, and that's, uh, that's an important thing. In terms of Switzerland, um, the degree of trust in Switzerland is actually quite amazing. So when the franc was extremely high a couple of years ago, there was this very quiet, you know, so Switzerland has this corporatist labor system, and they got basically their big labor unions to take a big wage uh, take back because they wanted to remain competitive. You couldn't do this in a million years in France, Italy, or the United States because in none of those countries do you have this kind of high trust system that allows labor and management to work uh, together in that fashion. And so there are some real advantages. Uh, I think the Swiss have probably used the referendum system a little bit more responsibly than Californians because there are more limits on the kinds of referenda that you can put up, whereas anybody with a pile of money can put anything before the voters uh, where I come from. Okay. David, you want to... Well, just, just, yeah, just quickly, I, I'm, I'm afraid I do agree that the, the dangerous word that you used is it makes it easy, because politics is hard, and things that make it easier aren't always the way to be effective. Malcolm Gladwell wrote an article at the time of the abortive Iranian revolution saying the revolution will not be tweeted, and it won't, and the reason it won't be tweeted is the most important thing in politics is durability, and the new technology for now has made political organizations easier to form and makes it easier for them to dissipate as well. And the evidence, I think, as yet isn't there that what it creates are durable alliances. And on Switzerland, Switzerland is the other showroom model of democracy that's always cited. But if America is the kind of big car that everyone thinks they might own, Switzerland is the sort of bijou model that people <laughs> look at it and think, that's nice, but it's not really necessary for anyone other than the Swiss. <coughs> Another country you won't be able to go to. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm happy. Yeah. I quite like this country, actually. You're doing yourself out of all sorts of holidays. Well. Here. All right. Okay. A uh, couple of su suggestions for uh, Francis Fukuyama. Uh, while you're in London, if you haven't seen it already, uh, do go to a satirical play called Great Britain, which is on at the Haymarket Theatre. Um, and that will show you the current state of British democracy. <laughs> <laughs> The other suggestion is perhaps you'd enlighten the chair of this debate where you got the inspiration for your title, The End of History, The Last Man. Okay. Oh, that's an easy one. <laughs> well, so The End of History is not my idea. It's, it's the philosopher Hegel who, uh, you know, Hegel was the first philosopher to basically argue that the truth was in a sense relative to uh, an unfolding historical process that continued to evolve, uh, but he believed that it would culminate in an end of history, meaning a point at which all of the basic political, you know, reason was unfolded in the world and all the basic contradictions were resolved. And you know, the, actually, the thinker that made this famous was Karl Marx, because the Marxists also believe in an end of history. Their end of history is communism. That human history will evolve, uh, we'll move from one stage to another, and the final resting place will be a communist uh, utopia. So it was very interesting when my original book came out, the one, so all over the Anglo-Saxon world, I got all these dumb, you know, <laughs> comments of, well, you know, how can you say history has ended? You know, didn't you see that the Red Sox won the World Series? I mean, isn't that history? <laughs> uh, and it was really only uh, in the Marxist world where they understood immediately that what I was saying was that the end to which we are evolving is not communism, it's the step before that, it's a bourgeois liberal democracy. Okay, you mentioned um, the words Great Britain. Now, as I'm not sure how much this is filtered through to California, uh, to the, the, the sunny uplands of Silicon Valley, but we've had a bit of a debate in this country over the last few weeks. <laughs> yes, um, I've heard. Um, <laughs> Now, of course, everyone, I was just up there last week, and it was an extraordinarily passionate, at times angry debate, described by many people on both sides of the argument as a flowering of democracy. Would you see it that way as well? Uh, yes, in a fundamental sense, that I don't think any of these uh, separatist movements in, in Scotland or Catalonia or Quebec or you know wherever could possibly really exist other than in a fundamentally end of history world, meaning that everybody can take economic integration and democracy for granted. So if independence meant a different form of government or 
you know, authoritarianism, or if they're running from authoritarianism, then that changes the debate, you know, very much. Uh, if you can take prosperity and democracy for granted, then the terms of the debate shift to a different set of issues having to do with identity. And in a certain sense, identity is the Achilles heel of modern democracies because the one thing that if you go back to Hobbes and Locke and you read your basic democratic theory, the one thing it does not tell you is what are the boundaries of the mm. community in which our democracy exists. Uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal, but you know, what's the community of people for whom you're going to guarantee that equal equality through a state that guarantees rights mm. and the like? Why does the border of the United States stop at the Rio Grande and people south of it are part of a different uh, community? And frankly, that's an unresolved, uh, you know, that's an unresolved issue here. Frank, do you want to weigh in on that one? I mean, to what um, extent does, you know, can, well, can, can you have resurgent nationalism and a flowering of democracy at the same time? Um, I think that what the Scottish thing was, it was fascinating and it was a remarkable exercise in democracy. I, I'm not, in my lifetime, there hasn't been anything quite like that in Britain, the sense of a sustained argument. And it was sustained yeah. over 18 months or more. The, thing I've, the two things I'm slightly suspicious of, and I'll, the second relates to Frank's point, but the first is just that thought that 85% turnout, this is what we need. We need to find issues that get 85% of the people out. 90% turnout in some elections in Iraq, it's not always a sign of health. I mean, we, we dress it up as the positive mm. story, it's about empowerment, but it's often also about... No, but people did people say it's amazing that 85% of the electorate turned out, yes. and it wasn't Iraq or no, North Korea. No, but w why they turn out in Iraq, and it's not mm. North Korea, no, I'm, not the, I'm not saying the Iraqi elections are fake, mm. they're not like North, not 99%, mm. 85%. Is because they're genuinely frightened of the other side winning mm. and the consequences. Right. I mean, it's that it's it's not a positive empowerment of our community. It's, it's a sense that our community is really divided. Yeah. And after all, if it's a positive story, the no still won. But the other issue is that the moves towards deepening democracy are moving it down the scale. They are about taking big units and making them smaller. And the reason that the argument didn't work is that when people look at the small unit they can then be frightened of the way in which it can be buffeted by bigger forces beyond the control. So Scotland would not be safe on that size in a world in which these much larger forces are at work. And unless the democracy argument can move both ways, unless, as it were, the Scottish nationalist movement can also link into a wider argument, say, about European democratisation, you combine Scottish independence with genuine elections across the European Union, with European political parties, that might work. If it just goes down the scale, then it leaves the bigger institutions free to be as undemocratic as they like. Okay, I want to go to questions up in the, in the gods. I'm afraid I've slightly ignored you because the glaring lights are so strong I haven't seen you. There we go. Do we have two up there? Two questions? Yes. Go to you first. Oh, there's a standing mic. Okay, I'm sorry. You have to move over. So if you want to ask a question up there, then you please you have to make your way over to the standing mic, which is there. There we go. Um, you asked, um, well, you uh, spoke earlier about Singapore and other stable non-democracies. And I wondered uh, whether you had any thoughts that you'd like to share on <clears throat> how democracies are meant to relate to stable, affluent non-democracies. Uh, and for my part, I kind of thought, well, Perhaps democracies can show magnanimity and their strength by relating constructively with non-democracies. Uh, and that hasn't necessarily been uh, the, tr the overriding trend of the neoliberal era that we've perhaps just come out of. Okay. Why don't we answer that question, and then we'll, the, the, meanwhile, the mic can make its way around to the next question. You want to take that one, Frank? Well, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to in terms of not getting along with non-democracies, because as far as I can tell, the United States and Britain, you know, trade with Singapore, they plenty of interchange, There's, they send students in both directions, and even with China, even though we have a lot more objections to human rights, uh, the situation of human rights in China, uh, the United States and China are joined at the hip economically, uh, for better or worse, and so it seems to me that the real story uh, is one of extraordinary cooperation between countries with very, very different 
uh, political system. So I'm not quite sure, you know, you have to get to North Korea or Zimbabwe or, you know, some pretty bad uh, authoritarian countries before I think that becomes the real obstacle in, in, in getting along. Okay, next question up there, please. Um, so how would you respond to uh, the, the idea that the, the greatest challenge to democracy in states like we find in the Middle East is its reliance on nationalism and identity? Frank? Frank? <laughs> <laughs> I was puffing, sorry, his, I had, I was puffing become, his book, but I you didn't were so, write it. I know, you, you've become sort of one and the same. Anyway, sorry. Oh, you want, okay. David? Frank? Yeah. No, actually, no, let, let David answer this okay, one. Okay, let David yeah. answer. Sorry, Frank. It's okay. okay. <laughs> It's a, it's a huge question. I mean, the, 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 the issue that Frank raised of where you draw the boundaries of these states, and certainly it's the case that in the 100-year success story of democracy, and, and really modern democracy, the kind of democracy that we're talking about and that we live in, is primarily a product of the First World War in many, many places. I mean, the First World War is a decisive event. So we're sort of at the 100-year centenary of that too. But in many parts of the world where democracy is working worst or not working at all. It's also because of the legacy of the First World War, the creation of states that cut across too many of these boundaries that have been propped up and kept in place too long by artificial and, and bad, oppressive, corrupt forms of politics. But the idea that the way to make democracy work is to simply unpack these artificial boundaries so that you get the right community in the right place is also not going to work in those communities. We're too far down the line for that. I mean, it's a, it's a really serious problem that nationalism is part of the problem, it's not part of the solution here, and yet these democracies, if they're going to work, need to be galvanized by a stronger sense of national identity. That is part of the, the fundamental tension of 21st century democracy. Yeah, uh, that is uh, a fundamental problem. I think that um, in the Middle East today, religion is playing very much of a similar role that nationalism played in 19th century Europe. And I would say in 19th century Europe, democracy got hijacked by nationalism. Uh, so beginning with the French Revolution, but accelerating in 1848 and then in 1870, uh, you had this upwelling of popular participation because people were getting richer, there was a bigger middle class, people were unhappy with uh, uh, authoritarian government. But there's lots of ways to mobilize people and clever political leaders look for whatever tool is available to get people out on the streets and get them angry and agitated. Uh, so this fight for democracy is one way of doing it, but national identity is another way, and this is really what went on in Germany and France and a lot of other European countries prior to 1914, and that had a devastating impact on democracy. And I actually think that religion plays exactly the same role in the contemporary Middle East. If you want to get people mobilized and out in the streets, uh, there are people like in the Arab Spring and Tahrir Square where liberal tolerant values can be the mobilizer, but there's also a large group of people who will be more easily mobilized by appeal to religious community. And I think, unfortunately, those people have taken over uh, for the time being. Uh, but it's important to understand that, well, I don't know whether this is much of a comfort. Uh, European democracy really had to work its way through nationalism in order to get to where it got to in 1945. You think the same can happen in the Middle yeah, East? Yeah, and I'm afraid that, you know, something like that may be happening in the Middle East. But, I mean, you, I mean, you wrote, and I think you both, both wrote about this, but you especially wrote about the fact that you cannot have the kind of democratic spark if you don't have the institutions and the laws that go with it. Therefore, do you think that one should not even have bothered trying to bring democracy? No, absolutely not. No, so you cannot... Okay, so first of all, it's not a question that any of us can, you know, like on this Olympian height say, no, no, these people shouldn't have democracy. You know, they should just stay at home and live under Mubarak or Ben Ali or any one of these, these clowns that were running uh, those countries, you know, prior to this. People don't want to live in those systems. They want dignity. They, you know, the Mohammed Bouazizi, who sparked the Arab Spring, had his vegetable cart taken away he went to the police several times, they slapped him, you know, absolutely denied his dignity as an individual. And the reason it was such a spark was that that was an extremely common experience mm. all across the region. And that's why the, the area blew up. And so it's not for any, certainly not for any of us to say, no, no, 
It was Don't a spontaneous be, combustion, wasn't it? Was it was a spontaneous combustion, and we should not be the ones to say no, you know, just be content with, with this awful kind of government. But it is true that, you know, the, the thing that's missing are institutions, and those are, you know, as David was uh, saying, just tremendously hard uh, to create, and the fact that you got the spark and the desire for participation does not mean that you can translate that then into uh, a, a democracy in which that that impulse is, is constructively channeled. Just briefly, um, Tunisia, is where, where Mohamed Bouazizi had his card burnt, um, is one of the most successful, perhaps the only successful example to emerge from the Arab Spring. Why do you think Tunisia has sort of dodged the bullet? It's a small country. It has a very large educated middle class relative to its neighbors. Uh, I think, you know, though, and, and, and then the behavior of the authoritarians matters. I mean, the Tunisians just didn't have an army the way the Egyptians did. Mm. And I think that it's the army that's really killed the revolution in Egypt. Could I just, could I just ask sure. something, which is, we often hear this analogy with 1848 and that the Arab Spring is the 1848 of that part of the world. And as you said, it took a long, long time to play through. Absolutely. Four or five decades or maybe a whole century. And I'm just very suspicious of those backward-looking <laughs> historical analogies projected forward. What's the world going to be like in 70 years' time? It could be unimaginably different. And it may be that the thing that has fundamentally changed since the turn of this century is time and the way in which it potentially is speeding up or the way in which the threats might accumulate or come together in a particular way. Mm -hmm. I don't take much consolation from the thought that the Arab Spring is the 1848 of the Arab world. If it's going to take 70 years, do you, do you think we've got 70 years to see this thing play out? Uh, probably not. No, that's, that's fair enough. I guess the point I was trying to make, though, was that if anyone thought that Egypt uh, or Tunisia or Libya would be like Poland, let's say, after sure. 1989, they were smoking something. But that's why, it's just that's really why 1989, which is your year, <laughs> it's the outlier here, right? I mean, right. we've been, that's I think right. we've been confused right. by thinking that 1989 is the model for this that's stuff. Right. It's, the, it's the freak event. That's it's right. not the Let me ask that you for a show of hands, very briefly, and then I will get on to you. How many people in the entire audience believe that in 70 years from now, democracy will be the predominant system of government on the planet? Okay. It's in great shape. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> over to you, please. Yes, hi. I would like to address the aspect of globalization and international relations. And my question would rather be speculative. Uh, what global order do you think we are moving towards? Would it be regionalism or more unity among the states? And in that global order, what do you think the role of international institutions would be? Thank you. <laughs> you know, over to you, David. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I am really worried about uh, a lot of parts of the world right now because it does seem to me that there's been a huge rise of nationalism. I went from Shanghai to Beijing to Seoul to Tokyo last uh, fall, and I was really actually pretty appalled uh, at the degree of nationalism in all of those countries that's, that's taken hold. And I think that our existing international institutions are extremely weak and will not be sufficient to contain those forces. And so, in that respect, I am pretty pessimistic. Uh, I think the what are you talking about here? War between China and Japan? Possibly, I think the or? yeah the the possibility of outright military conflict in East Asia is <coughs> is significant right now, it, and people far away from it, don't understand how, you know, how dangerous that situation is. I mean, if, if people in this room overwhelmingly think that in 70 years' time we're going to be living in a broadly democratic world, it'll have to be because some of these institutions have themselves been democratized. And at the moment, they aren't. I think the dominant form of international organization is technocratic, not democratic. And I am myself very suspicious of the... The, I see the pull of it, you know, the pull of technocracy is precisely that it's problem solving. But the pull of technocracy also pulls you away from the thought that there are moments where you need political solutions to political problems that draw in the actors and engage with them politically, not as problems to be solved. And so my suspicion of the, the international political order in the current wave of globalization is as it moves down a technocratic path, 
it leaves these political issues to be resolved by traditional political means, which include things like war. Um, so you know, that optimism, one thing that could puncture it is we've got to think of a way to democratize these international institutions. And you know, it's not fashionable anymore, but you know, I'm one of those people, I don't believe in e-democracy or anything like that, but I still hang on to the belief from 20 or 30 years ago that the European Union should democratize itself, but should become a proper continental democracy. And that seems to have gone out of fashion with the rise of nationalism. But something's got to give, the UN, the EU, the WTO, if democracy is going to win, You've got to find a way to democratize them too, or otherwise you're going to get democracy and technocracy. And do you see democracy <coughs> and nationalism growing together, or do you think democracy is still the best antidote against nationalism? Well, I mean, it, it, it does obviously depend it, it, in, mm. in lots of different scenarios. It plays out in different ways. But internationalism, which was one of the 20th century dreams, seems to have died as a democratic movement. And if we don't revive it, we are going to get a split between national democracies and international technocracy. And that clash, it's not going to be a war. We're not going to go to war with the UN, but the UN will be irrelevant to our fight. Okay, there's a whole cluster of questions in the middle there. And then I will get on to you after that, but let's deal with the cluster first. The lady in blue, please. And if you then maybe pass it behind you so we can get two or three questions in one go. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who you know, arguably understands the most about the web, is speaking on Saturday night at the South Bank Centre, as it happened. Uh, and he is making a plea to all governments across the world to hold on to the potential for the democratic possibility of the web and not allow it to be corrupted and, uh, and owned. And he's making that almost like a one-man stand against the, the, the possibility that we'll lose that democratic uh, possibility. I'm interested to know who is doing something similar to him on the democratic front. I mean, who is walking around the world speaking of how to preserve and propel democracy forward? Because obviously it's a very anxious debate and a pessimistic debate, you could say, that we're having tonight. What, who's making the best stab at changing the possibility of strengthening democracy, do you think? The people of Scotland, clearly. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you've talked so far about the, the model democracy in the States. I've just returned from living there for three years, and I entirely agree they're stuck. The country is vast. There is a, a real resistance to anyone ever saying, uh, you know, let's look at another country, because once you're in America, there's nowhere better than America, and the model's perfect. For such a huge country that I can't help thinking, had it been smaller, by now there would have been either change or revolution. I'd be interested to know, and I suppose it's directed to you, Francis, what you think, where you think we talk about 70 years from now, where is it going? Because the people that live in the States feel entirely stuck. Nothing's changing, nothing's working. The majority can want things like gun control, and in fact, nothing's actually done. There is such, such inefficiency in government. Um, is there a quick fix? Is there a country they could follow if they would listen? Uh, or are they doomed? Okay. <laughs> All right, and we'll have one more, and then we'll try and we'll pack them all in. There we go. Make it quick, please. Um, you both talked about trends, environmental challenges, but then also automation. So if we look at Google's cars, the, the threat that puts, poses to low, low and middle skilled workers, and we could all point to others like demographic change and the demand that puts on rationing care and so forth. What do you think? Are these challenges that democracies haven't faced before, or has it? Is there a reason why we've got worse at addressing long-term challenges? Is it that the as the electorate's got larger, it's on average got thicker. Um, and are there any practical solutions outside of just our elites sort of collectively waking up one morning and deciding to act collectively on these difficult issues that, that we, either the elites or the masses, could be putting in place to try and address some of those long-term challenges? Okay. Who would like to take this trifecta of questions? Well, let me start with the first couple. Yeah. So there is actually a, a, an international web of organizations that are devoted to promoting democracy. There's the World Movement for Democracy, which is a group of civil society activists mostly that share you know, knowledge, experience, best practices on how to uh, fight for democracy. There's something called the Community of Democracies that was founded by a number of democratic governments that, again, tries to share information. So I do think that there is, and then there's a whole web of human rights, you know, democracy organizations, labor unions, all of which constitute a kind of international uh, civil society. So I do think that that, uh, that infrastructure um, exists. On the question of the United States, 
uh, I'm pessimistic that the system will just correct itself by itself uh, in the short run. Uh, either you're going to wait for demographic change, uh, which I think in the long run favors the Democrats, but that's a very slow process, or it's going to take an external shock. And among the things that the United States is privileged by, given its size, is the fact that everybody holds dollars. And we can make mistakes that an Argentina or an Uruguay could never mistake, you know, make in a, in a million years uh, you know, because of that fact. And that insulates us from, uh, you know, from being forced uh, to fix some of our bad habits. Uh, but a big shock may come. Uh, I think David's quite right that we shouldn't wish for that. But, um, but maybe that sets up you to answer that, the last question. Well, I mean, there are people who believe that, to bring those two questions together, that the shock is going to be when virtual currencies take off. So when I talked about a crisis of the new technology, I didn't, it doesn't have to be sort of the whole system folding. It could be just something which fundamentally changes the right. terms of the system. I don't know enough about how these things work, but you can imagine precisely the thing that pulls the rug under the global reserve currency could be the shock. But no one in their right mind should think that the shock comes we put up with the pain and then we emerge better and stronger at the other, the other side. We, we just don't know. Who's speaking up for the democracy, for democracy of the web and of the internet? So Edward Snowden thought that's what he was doing, right? He thought if he told the world what the NSA was up to, that would galvanize democratic publics to demand their privacy and their rights. And has it? In Germany, because Germany is a democracy that works, but also because Germany has an experience of the worst of these things, which can't be replicated. But elsewhere, no. People in Britain galvanized by this, no. The effect it seems to have had is drive nationalism on the web, so that Putin wants his own internet, and Brazil wants its own internet, and they want their own national rules, because they don't like the idea of the NSA's rules being everybody's rules. So it's, it's very, very difficult. But there are you know, the people who believe if you tell the world, how the world is run, that will galvanize democratic publics, are often disappointed. Democratic publics have to hit the bad news head on. And we didn't hit the bad news with the Snowden revelations because most people think well, that was nothing to do with us. It's very difficult. And on the question of elites, I mean, this is an issue that also comes out of Francis's book, and I don't know how he resolves this, but you know, the story of democratic progress often depends upon small elites taking the decisive step. The problem with current democracy <coughs> is that small elites have captured it. And that may be part of the bind we're in. The elites need to wake up one morning and decide how to get out of this mess. But if they do, we will just squeal. It's more elitism. OK, question over there, gentleman with the glasses. Hello. Um, I, I must say, I'm, I'm now rather hesitant about my question, but I'll go ahead anyway. Uh, go on. <laughs> I, I, I was going to put in, a, put in a word, a positive word, for technocratic government. Uh, uh, you can see why I might be a bit hesitant. Um, I, I attended an Intelligence Squared debate about a year ago, which was, uh, which would, should China adopt uh, a Western democracy? And, and the most powerful arguments were against, and they won the vote. I'm not sure, do you remember, the, do you remember it? Uh, and they won the vote, uh, and, and, and the argument was uh, from somebody, uh, the argument was that, that, that the, place would, the place has got uh, well over a billion people. It would collapse within a year if you had Western democracy. Similarly, and, the, and it's not very different from Europe. The, the way, the way Europe, Europe is governed in a very technocratic way, uh, uh, and, and the difference between how Europe's governed and how China's governed is not hugely great. Okay, so what's, what's the question? Uh, uh, is, is technocracy is in fact, a good thing? If we look 70 years ahead, perhaps techno technocratic governments okay. are going to be more, com yep. more common than, demo than ordinary so, 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 wants to say so, so just to say in response to that, I think we, we need to be careful about assuming there's this thing called technocracy, which is ruled by experts, and they're the people who work out what we need to do and do it. There's Chinese technocracy, there's European and Western technocracy. Chinese technocracy is ruled by engineers. The Chinese technocrats tend to be trained as engineers. Western technocracy is ruled by economists. So when our democracies get into trouble in, in Italy and in Greece, we call in the people who used to work for Goldman Sachs, partly because they all know each other, so they can <laughs> talk to each other in a language they understand. The Chinese Politburo is made up primarily often of Western-trained, American University-trained engineers. These are two very different views of what the challenge of technocracy is. And I can envisage a scenario over the next 70 years 
where the technocracies clash. Economic, economic democratic technocracy against engineering autocratic technocracy. And that will be a clash of politics. It won't be a clash of experts having an argument about the expert way to solve it. It will be a clash of politics. So though there are lots of things to be said for technocracy, we need to be careful about assuming that China and Europe are governed the same way because we put the experts in charge. Neither system would recognize the other system as being made up of experts. Let me ask a question. We're nearing the end, I'm afraid. Um, you know, we started with 25 years ago, the flowering of democracy, the Berlin Wall came down. You know, you had the two very sort of, um, you know, the two counterpoints, um, Tiananmen Square, suppression of democracy, the Berlin Wall coming down, the flowering of democracy. Is the problem of the last 25 years that the, the other story, the negative story, has either become too nuanced or is too dissipated, that we don't have you know, an oppositional image to democracy that we can cling on to that, you know, frightens us sufficiently to kind of make the best of the system that we have here? Well, I think it's certainly the case that the Cold War did focus the mind about, you know, what was valuable mm -hmm. about our system. And now the alternatives are much more diffuse. You do have places like North Korea and Cuba that are still really... But they're not bad. real sort of systemic alternatives. They're not they're, systemic they're alternatives, yeah. yeah. And they're not going to take over the world... Yeah. Uh, and that sort of thing. And as I said, you know, it, it's actually a good exam question for a university. I mean, what's wrong with Putin's Russia? You know, it's, mm. it's much harder in a way to define that because he is popular, he's elected, there's some degree of freedom in that society. The real problem is it's kind of like a uh, kind of insider trading clique, you know, that, mm. that holds all the assets for themselves, but that's very murky and, and, and non-transparent. And that is hard to get your juices flowing about, you know, how evil a system it is compared to Stalin's Russia that had gulags and killed millions of uh, people. Does democracy need that kind of, you know, that, that evil image on the other side to survive? Well, I, I think that the current problem and the problem of the last 25 years is the success of democracy means that the, a lot of people who live in democracies don't like it, they're frustrated, they're angry. The rival is anti-politics. It's not a different kind of politics. It's the Russell Brand alternative, which is... You know, don't vote and hope that the system collapses and is replaced by something better. It's not an alternative system. And anti-politics as a rival to politics, one, will always lose because politics beats anti-politics, and two, is a dangerous distraction because while we're doing anti-politics, the politicians will take care of themselves, the elites will take care of themselves. Do you agree what, with that, Frank? We need no, more politics. We need less anti-politics. Technocracy is often a form of anti-politics. Google is a kind of anti-politics. I think the people who run Google probably believe in anti-politics. You know, democracy is this slow, analog thing in a digital world. Let's have something zippy, snappy. Let's have a self-driving car. And then when, when the self-driving car crashes, who's going to sort out the mess? Politicians the will have to make laws. And if we're not engaged in politics, they'll make the laws for but us. But the people who run the Googleplex would say they are the ultimate manifestation of democracy. Yeah, they would, but they're wrong, because they are... <laughs> They are, they are people who don't actually, I think, believe in politics because it's too slow and it's too cumbersome. And technology offers this magical glimpse of a world in which we can actually zip around the edge of it and get to what we want. And we can't. We have to go through it. So while they're zipping around the edge of it, the politics will take care of itself. So I, I mean, I'm not saying... You know, I know their motto is do no evil. I'm not saying they do evil. But it is dangerous when you think about democracy and politics to fall for the attractive illusion of anti-politics. It's not real. Okay, I think we have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Frank and David.